All right, this is chapter 11. Chapter 11 is going to be on airway management. Um, in this chapter, we will apply knowledge, fundamental depth, fundamental foundational breath of the airway and anatomy and physiology to patient assessment and management in order to assure a patient airway adequate mechanical ventilation and respiration for all patients. And always, okay. Um, so the we're we'll looking at airway management as far as the anatomy of the airway assessment and techniques for assuring respiration, the anatomy of the respiratory system, the physiology and pathophysiology of respiration, pulmonary ventilation, oxygen. Some respiration competencies as far as external, internal, and cellular respiration, assessment management of adequate and inadequate respiration, supplemental oxygen therapy, and then some artificial ventilation stuff with minimal ventilation, alveolar ventilation, and the effect of artificial ventilation on cardiac output. So, pathophysiology. Um, as far as how it applies comprehensive knowledge of the pathophysiology of respiration and perfusion to patient assessment and management. So, introduction the most important steps in care for any patient is obtaining and maintaining um, a patent airway and ensuring that the patient is breathing adequately. The oxygen reaches the body tissues and cells through breathing and circulation. I've always said, you know, even in other classes, that if you do not have a patent airway, you do, you know, a lot of times you don't have a, a patient. Um, without that oxygenation reaching um, the tissues and the cells, even with artificial ventilation, um, you, you're not, you're, you don't have a patient, an adequate patient. Um, you don't have what is needed to make sure that the rest of the body is able to function. So you always need to make sure that the airway is secure and, in, and it's somewhat patent somehow, whether that is with um, supplemental devices or actually taking them off um, over that airway. So the airway is divided into the upper and lower airway um, structure facilitate oxygenation and ventilation uh, includes the diaphragm, uh, muscles of the chest wall, accessory muscles um, of breathing, uh, and nerves from the brain and spinal cord to those muscles. So ventilation is the exchange of air between the lungs and the environment. Um, so you, get, you, you have to have the diaphragm um, to help um, move those muscles of the chest wall Sometimes you need accessory muscles, so, but, um, such as abdominal muscles, uh, neck muscles um, for breathing, and then those nerves from the brain to and the spinal cord to those muscles must be intact. So. Um, this figure shows you the upper and lower airways. Um, you've got the upper airway with the nasal um, pharynx, the nasal passages. The pharynx, oral pharynx, mouth, epiglottis, the larynx. You got the apex of the lung, of the lungs at the top with the trachea going down. It bifurcates into the um, bronchioles. Um, you know, you, we'll learn that the right is a little bit straighter than the left right is. Um, then you got down into the main bronchial. Um, and then down into the base of the lung and the capillaries and alveoli. So, and you see the diaphragm down here at the bottom that helps um, those lungs rest and that gives them structural support. And the major functions of the upper airway are to warm, filter, and humidify the air into the body. Um, the pharynx is composed of the major pharynx, the oral pharynx, and the um, Laryngeal pharynx, so 
the laser fairing is um, formed by using the facial bone. So it's, um, it's divided by the settler. It's lined with the cilia, the mucosal membrane. The cilia um, help move contaminants out of the body. The turbulence creates the turbinate, increase the surface area of the nasal um, mucosa. The sinuses are cavities formed by cranial bones. The fractures of the certain sinus bones may cause a leakage of CSL in through the nasal passageways and um, auditorial canal. These tissues of the nasal pharynx are extremely delicate and highly um, vascular, um, which you know should explain a lot with the. So I'm trying to talk about this PowerPoint slide with the um, last one, so that you could see it as I was talking about it. I'm gonna talk about the next and the oral pharynx. Going back, well, I can't do that. The oral pharynx is found as part of the throat, found the posterior of the oral cavity. The epiglottis is a leaf shaped um, cartilage, just flat, located at the base of the tongue and above the larynx. So we'll talk about the um, epiglottis a lot and its function. Um, basically, that's what um, keeps foreign bodies out of your trachea and it should open up for the um, GI tract. All right, the larynx is formed by many independent cartilage structures, main laryngeal structures of thyroid cartilage. As you progress on in your training, you'll learn a lot about the thyroid cartilage. The body covering is the nearest portion of the adult trachea. All right, the lower airway. Function of the lower airway is to exchange oxygen from the outside. The external boundaries are the fourth cervical vertebrae in a diaphoid process. So the trachea is the conduit for air entry into the lungs. When the trachea reaches the thoracic cavity, it divides at the level of the carina. The lungs include the smaller bronchi, bronchioles, and the alveoli. I mean, I'm going to flip over to the next um, slide so that you can see this as I'm talking about. So you can see the trachea um, and where it divides or bifurcates at the carina. Um, so each bronchius divided into small bronchi, which are divided into bronchioles. Bronchioles are thin, hollow tubes made of smooth muscle. Um, smaller bronchioles branch into the alveolar. Ducts that end in the alveolar site. The alveoli are the functional site for exchange of O2 and CO2. Oxygen diffuses through the line of the alveoli into the pulmonary cap capillaries. So the surfactant lines the alveoli. This is what decreases surface tension and helps keep the alveoli expanded. And the amount, if the amount of surfactant is inadequate or the alveoli are not inflated. The alveoli collapse, which results in um, hardening of it. Actus pacis, I think is how you say that. So between the lungs is a space called the mediastinum, which is surrounded by tough connective tissue. This contains the heart, the great vessels, the esophagus, the trachea, the major bronchi, and many nerves. So I've just talked about a lot of these slides um, and how I'll be able to uh, divide up. And this one talks about um, this is fractured and in dividing into the capillaries, pulmonary capillaries. So between the lungs and the mid asylum, surrounded by tough uh, connected tissue, the phrenic nerve innervates diaphragmatic muscle. Allowing it to contract.
All right, let's start calling the vascular systems work together to ensure a constant supply of oxygen and nutrients to every cell in the body. It also ensures that CO2 and waste products are removed from every cell in the body. And sufficient levels of external ventilation and perfusion are required to deliver adequate amounts of oxygen to the tissues of the body. Sufficient external ventilation and perfusion are required to deliver adequate oxygen to the tissues of the body. So time is critical. If you're without oxygen for zero to one minute, you've got cardiac irritability. A zero to four minutes brain damage is not likely. Four to six minutes brain damage is possible. And six to ten minutes brain damage is likely. So more than ten minutes brain damage is irreversible. And, and, you know, to kind of get back to CPR, I should explain this in detail at the class. But this is why we try to do the um, chest compressions only CPR with more oxygen is left inside the body at that static state um, with no respiratory, you know, no respiratory supplementation. Um, at least we'll move a lot of oxygen is left in the body, inside the body you know, to help prevent this. So ventilation is moving of air into and out of the lung. Inhalation um, is active and muscular part of the breathing. So air enters the body through the mouth and the nose and moves through the trachea. The diaphragm and intercostal muscles contract along through with air. The ability of the lungs to function properly is dependent on the movement of the chest and supporting the structure. So, um, the thorax, the thoracic cage, the diaphragm, and the accessory muscles move. Um, so, the diaphragm is a specialized skeletal muscle. Functions as both the voluntary and involuntary muscle. Partial pressure is the amount of gas in air dissolved in fluid, such as blood. It's measured in millimeters of mercury. The uh, body attempts to equalize the partial pressure, um, which is, results in oxygen diffusion across the membrane and through the blood. The atmospheric pressure is normally higher than the air pressure within the thorax. During inhalation, a slight vacuum is created. Gases such as oxygen will move from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure until the pressure equals. The entire press process of inspiration is focused on delivering oxygen to the alveolus for that exchange. The variations in tidal volume and respiratory rate are both will affect the minute volume. So, you see how the diaphragm contracts an A to help the lung feel. And then um, it relaxes and B to help the lungs be. All right, exhalation does not require muscular effort. Um, it's a passive process. So, hair bearing reflex is a feedback loop that prevents overexpansion of the lungs by terminating um, inspiration. Okay. So that's what tells your body, hey, it's time to exhale um, while you know, you're in and out. Relaxation of diaphragm and the intercostal muscles increases intracoronary pressure. Um, when the size of the thoracic cage decreases, um, area in the lungs is comprised into a small space, increasing air pressure. Maximum expiration occurs when diaphragm and intercostal muscles relax, and air is exhaled. Exhale it forcefully as opposed to normal passive process. So the regulation of ventilation involves a complex series of receptors and feedback loops. The drive of breath is based on pH changes in the blood and CSF. When oxygen levels, in a healthy person with oxygen level rising, the respiratory center suspends respiration to a rising CO2 level stimulates the respiratory center. So CO2 always stimulates. So the um, process of blood oxygen molecule onto hemoglobin molecule is in the bloodstream. 
adequate oxygenation is required for internal respiration to take place. External respiration is a process of breathing fresh air into the respiratory system. Uh, it then exchanges the CO2 and O2 between the VLI and blood in the pulmonary capillaries. For adequate ventilation, it does not guarantee external respiration. So, hemoglobin molecules pick up fresh oxygen as it crosses the alveolar membrane. All right, internal respiration is the exchange of oxygen. And CO2 between the systemic circulatory system and the cells of the body. Aerobic metabolism occurs in the presence of oxygen. Aerobic always, like we talked about before, needs O2. So the energy is formed, um, energy in the form of ATP is produced through curve cycle, correction of the curve cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation. Anaerobic is always without oxygen. It does not need O2, so it cannot meet metabolic demands of the cell. Right. Neural control, primary control comes from the medulla and palm of the brain, um, back there in the um, back of the brain stem. The medulla respiration center controls rate, depth, and rhythm of breathing. Um, the apneustic center of the palm is a secondary control center. Pneumotaxic unit has an inhibitory influence on inspiration, and the respiration rate results from the interaction between agnostic and pneumotaxic centers. In times of increased demand, the pneumotaxic center decreases its influence. All right, chemo receptors um, affect respiratory rate and depth, and they'll constantly monitor. The chemical composition of body fluids. Uh, essential chemical receptors monitor pH in the CSF and are, are located adjacent to the respiratory centers in the medulla. An increase in the acidity of CSF triggers the central chemoreceptors to increase the rate and depth of respiration. Chemoreceptors in carotid bodies and the aortic arch measure the amount of CO2 in arterial blood. Chemoreceptors located in the um, same places respond to decrease in partial O2. And when the serum CO2 and hydrogen ion levels increase, chemoreceptors stimulate the dorsal and ventral respiratory groups in the medulla to increase the respiratory rate. The dorsal respiratory group is responsible for initiating respiration based on the information received from the chemoreceptors. And the ventral respiratory group is primarily responsible for motor control and inspiratory and expiratory muscles. So basically, this gets down into the chemical response and what stimulates um, inspiration to um, take place in um, exhalation. So disruption of pulmonary ventilation, oxygenation, and respiration will cause many effects on the body. So, such things as Hypoxia is tissue and cells of the body do not get enough oxygen. Hypoxic drive stimulates breathing when the arterial oxygen level falls. And this is less sensitive and powerful than the carbon dioxide sensors in the brain stem. And it is typically found in end stage COPD. So, this is why we talk about hypoxic drive with COPD because it stimulates arterial oxygen levels to fall. Right. Early signs of hypoxia include restlessness, irritability, apprehension, tachycardia, and anxiety. Um, usually, this is the onset of degree of tissue damage caused by hypoxia. It depends on the quality of ventilation. So late signs include nerve stage changes or weak pulse prognosis. Um, responsive patients will report shortness of breath, dizziness. They may not be able to talk and complete sentences. Always administer your O2 before signs and symptoms of hypoxia try to appear. Ventilation and confusion must be matched to exchange simple diffusion of gas exchange. Uh, failure to match ventilation and confusion contributes to most abnormalities in oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange. When ventilation is compromised, but perfusion continues, blood passes over the alveolar membranes without gas exchange taking place. 
the result in aerial confusion is less oxygen absorption in the bloodstream and less carbon dioxide absorption. Um, many intrinsic and extrinsic factors cause airway obstruction and interruptions in central and peripheral nervous systems affect um, the ability to breathe efficiently. So, hypercapnia is overall increasing CO2 level in bloodstream. Trauma to the head and spinal cord can also interrupt nervous system control and ventilation. Muscular dystrophy causes um, degeneration of muscle fibers, slowing motor development and loss of muscle contractility. Patients with allergic reactions may also experience a decrease in pulmonary ventilation from bronchial constriction. Extrinsic factors include trauma from body and airway obstruction. So respiratory splinting can result in decreased pulmonary ventilation, hyperventilation, slow breathing. Um, carbon dioxide production exceeds the body's ability to eliminate it. So carbon dioxide elimination is depressed with the extent that no longer keeps up with the normal. Hyperventilation is rapid breathing. Carbon dioxide elimination exceeds carbon dioxide production. So hyperventilation and hyperventilation can represent the body's attempt to compensate for many different factors. Factors affecting oxygenation, respiration, external factors um, such as the attachment of CO molecules to hemoglobin molecules can cause false pulse ox reading. So I always think about that if you do have a patient that is exposed to carbon monoxide. Um, it mainly comes from propane um, being from heating or um, Kerosene gas. Internal factors, <laughs> conditions that reduce the surface area for gas exchange, such as pneumonia, pulmonary edema, and COPD. Also, you have non functional BLI, pulmonary shunning, changes in respiratory rate, pain, and strong emotion, hypoxia, decreased metabolism. Um, some other factors. You know, including the pox, the hypoglycemia, and infection. Um, they, without sufficient glucose, the cells will metabolize fatty acids, increasing ketoacidosis, which increases um, chemical responses uh, to CO2. All right, so circulatory compromises leads to inadequate perfusion, obstruction of blood flow to individual cells and tissues related to trauma. Uh, some conditions you may encounter include pulmonary embolism, uh, simple and normal tension pneumothorax, open pneumothorax, hemothorax, and hemonema. Other factors in heart failure and cardiac tamponade inhibit the ability of heart to effectively pump. You may have hemodramatic shock. Vasodilatory shock. Um, of course, to treat these patients um, to be in shock, so high flow to. So, all right. As the base um, balances do cause hypo and hyperventilation, and it does cause a shift in the acid base balance, even from acidolic or alpha two or alkalotic shifts. Now, this may result in rapid deterioration of death. Excess acid um, can be expelled as carbon dioxide from the lung. Uh, slowing the respiration will increase the level of carbon dioxide. The fastest way to eliminate the hydrogen ions is to create order in carbon dioxide. So anything that inhibits respiratory function can result in uh, acid retention and acidosis. Acidosis can be caused due to low respiratory rate or tidal volume. Alkalosis can be caused by high respiratory rate or tidal of volume, and then you form a clinical presentation of acid based disorders on, on the following so respiratory and metabolic acidosis and alkalosis. So these fluctuations in pH due to the available bicarbonate levels result in metabolic acidosis and alkalosis. Right. Recognizing adequate breathing. Um, breathing should appear easy, not labor. Um, 
no more expressions, you know, for adults is 12 to 20, you know, adequate depth, make sure the tidal volume is good, make sure that they can good deep um, inhalations and exhalations. Uh, that regular pattern and pattern of inhalation and exhalation, and, you know, making sure by auscultation that those are equal and clear on both sides. Recognizing inadequate breathing, an adult patient who is breathing at a rate fewer than 12 um, or more than 20 should be evaluated for signs and symptoms of inadequate breathing. And patients with respiratory distress often come state with torrential position. Um, so they may be sent forward, laying, you know, laying back on um, one side or the other. We're trying to find that comfortable position to just be able to breathe in and out. So respiratory stress may be a result of upper and lower obstruction, inadequate ventilation, impairment of respiratory muscles, impairment of the nervous system, so dyspnea, difficulty in rest or difficulty in respiratory rate record, um, or effort. So that's you know saying the patient is short as well you can also describe it basically as dyspnea. So the time when assessing a patient with respiratory stress has patient position, um, he or she is in a chop off position, you know, possibly elbows out, um, leaning over a little bit, sitting down, like their heads are out above their knees. If the patient experiences an ostomia, um, or it's near, um, sitting, um, standing and sitting, is there adequate rise and fall of the chest? Is the patient gas gasping? Is the color of the skin, or what is the color of the skin? Is it fine on it, pale, uh, redding, mo modeling, or is the skin moist and clammy? Um, let's have that sweaty feeling. Um, also, look at is there flaring of the nerves present? Patient breathing through pursed lips. Do you know any retractions? Any muscle, accessory muscle use? Chest while moving symmetrically? Both sides up and down, or do they take a series of quick breaths followed by a prolonged exhalation process? So these are all signs um, that you do have inadequate deep sneeze present. So patient with inadequate breathing may appear to be working hard for the support. Um, All right, signs of inadequate breathing in adults, respiratory rate fewer than 12 breaths per minute or more than 20 breaths per minute, irregular rhythm, diminished absence or noisy, auscultative breath sounds, abdominal breathing, reduced flow of expired air, and unequal or inadequate chest expansion. So please be mindful of the diminished absence and noisy auscultative breath sounds as they can. We go through and start talking about how to treat these. Um, you want to be able to distinguish between those um, absent um, or they just diminished, or is there some type of noise that you're hearing? So, increased effort in breathing, shallow breath, correction of shallow depth, the skill, tail, sound all that cool, more models of moist, those retractions and the staccato breathing pattern, speech patterns, I'm sorry. So, um, pay particular attention to the external environment, auscultate breathing, fear for um, feel for air movement at the mouth and nose, observe the chest entry and note any paradoxical motion. So, evaluate for pulses paradoxes so, and assess the patient's history. Assess the history of the present illness. Pulses paradox is when the inhale up, inhale and the pulse goes, goes away and when the exhale comes back. Shine notes, notes um, protect the reflexes of the airway and modify forms of respiration such as um, sighing and hiccuping. Serious head injuries may also cause irregular interface respirations that may or may not have a identifiable pattern. So head injuries will have this. Science, um, Stokes breathing, um, where they're 
take quick little breaths in and out, and they won't breathe. Quick little breaths in and out, and they won't breathe. And that's a sign of head injury. Agonal gasp. Uh, my patient may appear to fatigue. They take a breath after his or her heart has stopped. And that's just the uh, last bit of agonal gas that their patients will do. Uh, and CPR needs to be started pretty quick. Uh, be vigilant when monitoring patients when in respiratory distress. Um, respiratory distress is a patient that you can fix really quick and one that we um, take care of on a daily basis. So the pulse oxygen is designed to assist only pulsating blood vessels. Uh, it can be used to monitor oxygenation status, identify deterioration, identify high risk patients in respiratory condition, and assess vascular status in orthopedic trauma. So if you think that somebody doesn't have an orthopedic trauma, and put salt salts down there and they have a break. It could tell you if that vascular um, vascular artery or vein has been severed. Alright, peak expiratory flow measurement helps evaluate bronchial constriction, Chris peak expiratory flow suggests that the patient is responding to treatment. Decrease in peak expiratory flow may be an indication of deterioration. So it varies based on sex, height, and age. And perform at least three times to indicate the best peak flow rate of the pre reading. Arterial blood gas analysis is something that you know, may not be done in a hospital setting, but just to um, Give you an idea of what's going on. Provides comprehensive quantitative information about the respiratory system. Normal AGB, ABG values are summarized in table 11 and 6. And to maintain normal ABG values, a balance between alveolar volume and perfusion of the alveolar capillaries must be maintained. Entitled CO2 assessment is something that we can do. Um, detects the presence of carbon dioxide in the exhaled air. And types of monitors include telemetric, digital, and digital waveform, which is all three that we have. Um, so, telemetric carbon dioxide detectors provide qualitative information regarding the presence of carbon dioxide in the patient's exhale breath. So, it might give a false reading if the patient has carbon dioxide trapped in the stomach from ingested carbonated beverages. This is usually why we try to do at least two to three breaths. Maybe you know up to five before we actually put this um, on the end of the tube to see if the color change happens. Uh, sensitive to extremes of uh, temperature and humidity. Um, Catmograph is a device that provides graphic representation of the quality output levels. Waveform technography or technography uh, provides quantitative real time information regarding the patient's HCL CO2 level. So, this is a normal one, and as you can see at the um, ledge, I call it there, it's um, ground 38. So quantitative waveform technography is the recognition method of monitoring initial. An ongoing um, purpose of the advanced airway device, technography can also serve as an indicator of the effectiveness of chest compression and detect return of spontaneous circulation. So, the use of entire CO2 monitoring is limited with patients in, with in cardiac arrest. Um, we do use waveform technography with um, respiratory patients. Via that nice cranial at the top one, um, it will give us a rating of the um, active patient. So you can also use it when performing CPR and you've got that advanced airway place, even with a king tube, you know, it will give you um, ratings if you have readings on 
with the 82 being, then you know that that toes play anything above around 19. Also, if you get spontaneous circulation back um, or rise, you can actually see that patient breathing also. And you're trying to bag, or if you're not bagging and that patient's breathing, you actually see the waveform up and down. So, so up in the airway, it says the breathing patient needs to be in two pound position, so ensuring that they do have it up in the way. So head tilt generally is maneuver positioning patients. These are for patients who, who have not sustained trauma. This is sometimes all that is needed for the patient to resume breathing just because of the uh, obstruction, maybe of the tongue or something else. Um, to perform a head tilt generally is maneuver, follow these steps. Um, put the patient's two fine position, place yourself beside the patient's head, and place the other head of one hand on the patient's forehead and apply it firmly backward pressure with or palm to tilt the patient's head back. Place the tip of your other hand under the patient's chin, lift the chin up or bring back the entire jaw with it and help them to tip, tilt the head back. And lose, lift so that the teeth are nearly brought together but avoid closing the mouth completely. So do Continue to hold the forehead and maintain the back until it's the head. Jaw pulse maneuver is the method um, if a cervical spine injury is suspected. Um, Kneel above the patient's head, place fingers um, behind the angles of the jaw, lower jaw, and move the jaw upward, using your thumbs to help position the lower jaw to allow breathing through the mouth and nose. This complete the maneuver should open the airway with the mouth wide open with a jaw jam forward. Alright, to open up a tongue jaw lift maneuver used to open the airway for oral pharyngeal suction. Cannot be used to ventilate a patient because it does not allow for adequate mass seal to perform the tongue jaw lift maneuver follow these steps. Position yourself at the patient's side, place the hand hand closest to the patient's head on the forehead. With your other hand, reach into the patient's mouth. Put your first knuckle on the incisors or the gum line while holding the patient's head and maintain the hand on the forehead. Lift the jaw straight up. All right, place the patient in the cover position if they're breathing on his or her own at a normal rate with adequate tidal volume. Um, so, and that does not. And these patients do not have a traumatic injury. Okay, so just roll the patient onto their side so that the head, shoulders, um, and torso move at the same time without twisting. Uh, place the patient's forearm and upper hand under his or her cheek. After the patients have resumed spontaneous breathing and to be resuscitated, the recovery position will prevent aspiration of vomit. So basically, you're allowing these patients to vomit. Um, out the corner of their mouth in the recovery position. Whereas if they were laying supine and the bottom of the came up, it would actually have to go back down. So suctioning is first priority. So make sure you've got your portable suction unit. Uh, make sure it provides nice human flow suction uh, from the mouth and the oil fan. Uh, if you hear gargling, be prepared to suction. I always try to um, make sure the suction is readily available in any kind of resuscitative efforts or even um, post resuscitation. Make sure that portable suction units do work. If you've got the old manual suction, they, they work well too, you know, if that's all you have. Alright, you should have a wide bore, thick wall, non kinking tubing, soft and rigid suction catheters, non breakable, disposable, disposable collection bottle. And then supply of water for rinse and deep tip. And please note that this supply of water um, is not used for other things. This is, this is only used for suction. So basically, you're using that um, to help clear out the bombers and look off my rinse. So you could have hollow um, 
from Ditch Crew with the box. You just can make the most gracious from there. Like, top for Pip, Captain Lewis, Best Friend, such a name. Dick Fernick, Tits with Persian, Tonto Rose Wire for an easy draft replacement. That soft flights that normally just happen, sometimes call the French or the whistle tips, can be used to um, search in the back of the mouth or the ET tube in the patients with a stoma. I always measure for proper signs by inserting in the catheter or before inserting in the catheter and never insert a catheter past the base. There are steps to operate the section unit, check the unit for proper assembly, um, turn on the section unit, test to ensure the basic pressure is more than 300. Millimeters in the island mercury and slightly attached to perfect calcium activity too. I always limit your section times from 10 to 15 seconds for adults, 10 for children, and 5 seconds for infants. Alright, place the section calcium into the ED2, put out some night ignition, easy central section up to bag a couple more times before you actually start section. This puts some extra O2 into the bloodstream. So that while you're not doing it and you're trying to clear out the um, vomit, uh, you're not depleting it too bad. Uh, apply suction as catheter is extracted. Always go in without suction and come out with suction. So basically, basic airway agents, you got the um, oil, oil pharyngeal airway prevents the tongue from obstructing the quality. So it's often used in conjunction with this bad valve mask that basically gets the tongue out of the way. It should be inserted in all responsive patients with low gag reflex. Major pharyngeal airways are used in patients with an intact gag reflex and who are able to maintain it, um, but higher in a patient who is unable to maintain the airway. So they may be suffering from an automatic status, just had a seizure. Um, can be used in extreme care and trauma patients but uh, it can cause a stable cold fracture. And it could penetrate um, the back of the brain. So look at even patients who are even, um, they have an autoimmune status. However, have an intact gay reflex. Contraindication severe head injury with blood draining from the nose, potentially for a basal skull fracture. And then saw that and it actually goes into the base of the skull. The history of fracture of the bone and making me use this experience. So, focusing on oxygen administered to any patient with potential hypoxia. Oxygen cylinders, check the oxygen cylinder and available for medical oxygen. And that is one good thing to make sure you check the monthly year stamps are important. So, oxygen can reduce pain. Um, the delivery method must be reassessed for coagulation and adjusted to coil. Um, oxygen cylinders are often made of lightweight aluminum or spun steel. Check the steel cylinder and make sure it's labeled. So, um, the length of time you can use the oxygen cylinder depends on the pressure in the cylinder's flow rate. Right. All right, liquid oxygen is oxygen that um, cools the aqueous state. Large volume of oxygen can be stored into a compressed cylinder. Um, containers do not need to be filled as often. Um, it does weigh less than aluminum and steel tanks. requires a large upright storage and has special requirements to fill in large volume of storage and cylinder transport. Some safety considerations content are under pressure always. Um, ensure that the correct pressure regulator, regulator is firmly attached before transport. A puncture hole in the tank can cause the cylinder to become a daily missile. Uh, do not handle a cylinder by the neck if you need alone. Um, cylinder should be secured with mounting bracket contact with the liquid oxygen should be prevented. Uh, pin indexing systems is um, prevent it's compressed gas industry and has a system for portable uh, cylinders to prevent oxygen regulator from being con connected to a different gas cylinder. So it features a series of pins on a yoke that must be matched with the holes on the valve stem of the gas cylinder. The arrangement of the pins and holes varies for different gases according to 
accepted national status. Each cylinder of specific gas has a given pattern and a given number of pins. The safety system for large cylinders is known as the American standard system. Pressure regulators is pressure of gas in a full oxygen cylinder is approximately 2,000 psi. Uh, regulation relays reduce the pressure to a more useful range, usually between 40 to 70 psi. Um, most reduce the pressure in, in a single stage. A two-stage regulator will reduce the pressure first to 700 psi and then to 40 to 70 psi. Final attachment for delivery for delivering the gas to the patient is usually a quick connect female feeding that will accept a quick connect male flow from a pressure hose or a ventilator or resuscitator. A flow mineral that will permit the regulator release of gas measure in liters per minute. So basically that just describes it coming from your intake through your line inside the walls of your animal into your um, quick connect female um, feeding that's on the side of the wall and then you have the male connector regulator that um, releases it down to liters per minute. All right, flow meters and pressure compensated flow meters. Um, two types are commonly used in board and gauge flow meters. So the pressure compensated flow meter is the float ball within a table cal calibrated tube. The float rises and falls according to the gas flow within the tube, and it's affected by gravity. Um, the board and gauge flow meter is not affected by gravity. The pressure gauge is calibrated to record the float rate. All right, operational procedures, open the flow meter to the desired flow rate. Um, confirm the flow to the device. Apply the oxygen device to the patient and make any necessary adjustments. Monitor the patient's reaction to the oxygen and to the oxygen device. Disconnect the tube from the flow nipple and turn off the cylinder valve when oxygen therapy is complete. And always try to remember that. Um, make sure you turn your valve off when you're on your tanks, whether it be the main tank or the portable tank. Uh, that you know that flow meter should have a um, little leakage and it continues to leak out. After turn off the flow meter, the gauge on the relay should be red zero and the tank valve closed. Some hazards with supplemental oxygen. Um, oxygen supports combustion. Oxygen toxicity is excessive supplemental oxygen can have an instrumental effect on patients with certain illnesses. Damage to the the cellular tissue as a result of the excessive oxygen levels in the blood. Um, corrective. Current evidence suggests that internal, that increased cellular oxygen levels contribute to the production of oxygen free radicals. So, tailor oxygen therapy to the patient's needs and use caution with administration. All right, some oxygen delivery devices um, non-rebuilding masks, bad valve masks. Devices and major cams. Right, so, non-breather is the preferred device in the pre-hospital setting. Contraindications include apnea and full respiratory effort. It does deliver oxygen passively. Requires adequate tidal volume for oxygen to be um, effectively drawn into the lungs. Um, does um, have a combination mask and reservoir bag system. So you have that mask and then, you know, the free oxygen um, fills the reservoir bag and attaches to the mask by a one-way valve. Exhale gases escape through the flapper on the valve side of ports, so by a one-way disc at the cheek areas of the mask. Um, the valve between the mask and the reservoir prevents patients from rebreathing exhale gases. So ensure that the reservoir bag is full before the mask is placed on the patient. Adjust the flow rate so the bag does not fully collapse when the patient exhales. On a correction, inhale. So leave the mask in place while oxygen is not flowing. Allow the patient to re-breathe. Exhale, carbon dioxide. So.
lived in the mask in place while it's from not for my last place to rebreathe the XL CO2. I used a pediatric mask for infants. Mask came on to lose the oxygen through two small tube like prongs that fit in the patient's nostril. Um, then we used the pre hospital set at home, and that's um, um, seems to be changing every time. Ineffective for patients with poor respiratory effort, severe hypoxia, apnea, and mouth breathing. They're used for patients requiring long term oxygen therapy for certain diseases, such as COPD, whose current complaint is unrelated to their respiratory disease. Um, partial rebreathing mask is similar to a non rebreathing mask, except there is no one way to balance between the mask and the reservoir. Patients rebreathe a small amount of the XNL air. It is ideal for patients experiencing hyperventilation syndrome. A venturi mask is has a number of attachments to vary the percentage of oxygen delivery while a constant flow is maintained. Um, air is drawn into the flow of oxygen as it passes a hole in the line. Medium flow of the device can deliver 24 to 40 percent of oxygen depending on the manufacturer. The advantage is the fine adjustment capabilities for long term management of patients and physiological safety. Tracheoscopy mask is a um, the patient that does not breathe through their mouth and nose. Um, so a specially designed tracheostomy mask cover a tracheostomy hole, have a strap that goes around the neck. If you have a tracheostomy mask, you can't improvise by placing a face mask. Um, oxygen humidifiers um, usually indicate for long term oxygen therapy, it does not dry out the nasal hairs. Um, Slow water is reservoir of need. All right, patients with, who are not breathing need artificial ventilation and supplemental um, O2. And an irregular breathing pattern will also require artificial ventilation. The signs of automatic status and inadequate minute volume are indications for assisted ventilation. Excessive accessory, accessory muscle use and fatigue from labor breathing. Are signs of potential respiratory failure. Um, the treatment options for patients in severe respiratory distress or respiratory failure, assisted ventilation, and CPAP. Assisted in a patient with ventilation using a bag valve mask um, device explains the procedure to the patient. Place the mask over the patient's nose and mouth. Squeeze the bag each time the patient breathes. After the initial five to ten breaths, slowly adjust the rate to deliver the appropriate total volume. So then adjust the rate and total volume to maintain the adequate minute volume. So, uh, normal ventilations versus positive pressure ventilations. Uh, artificial ventilations are not the same as normal ventilations. Uh, during normal ventilations, the diaphragm contracts and negative pressure in the surface cavity sucks the air into the chest. Positive pressure ventilation generated. By device forces air into the chest cavity from the external environment. So it can cause the wall of the chest cavity to push out of the normal anatomic shape, and this can increase the overall inthoracic pressure within the chest cavity. So venous blood flow is decreased due to the increased pressure in the chest. The rate and volume of RF artificial ventilation must be regulated, regulated to avoid over distension of the chest wall. So the force generated from positive pressure ventilation causes air to enter and not to enter not only in the trachea but also the esophagus, and it does have a potential risk for gastric distinction. So mouth to mouth and mouth to mask ventilation, uh, mouth to mouth ventilation is routinely performed with a barrier device to eliminate the risk of unknown communicable diseases and physiological correction. And psychological barriers. So, mouth to mask ventilation is performed, places a physical barrier between the rescue's mouth and the patient's mouth. Um, most masks offer a one way valve to prevent exposure to blood and bodily fluids. Also, easier to secure an effective seal with a mask. So, a mask with oxygen inlet provides oxygen during mouth to mask ventilation to supplement the air from the arm. So, bag mask device can deliver only as much volume as you squeeze out of the bag by hand. Um, it can deliver nearly 100% O2. Uh, provides less tidal volume than mouth to mask ventilation, but higher concentration, higher O2 concentration. 
the most commonly used method in the field, typical field to master because of the seal. And it takes two registers to use bag, bag mail for bio on a trauma patient unless an event that was already being inserted. So it's most effectively used with supplemental O2 in the reservoir. And depending on the patient's LSD, use an or or nasal airway adjunct in conjunction. It should not be used on any patient who is intolerant of its use. So if the patient is responsive to breathing, inadequate ventilatory assistance with a bag mail mask will be required to maintain adequate mean volume. So you know, basically if that patient is able to breathe, you may want to push in some air to help that minute volume. Alright, now you have that disposable self refilling bag, the outlet valve, oxygen reservoir, the one way non jam inlet valve system, and transparent face mask. Volume air to deliver is based on visible chest rise. Typically, typically adult bag mask device holds as much holds a much larger volume area than needed. Uh, quick forceful delivery of breath may result in gastric extension, so day conscientious of rate and delivery devices. Uh, try to work with a partner. Uh, three major considerations on um, what I just talked about right there. To use the two person bag mask device, kneel it above the patient's head, maintain the patient's neck in a hyperextended position to open up the airway just slightly so that the air can be um, flowing into the trachea and not be, um, as much into the uh, esophagus. Open the patient's mouth and suction as needed, bring the lower jaw up to the mask with the last three fingers. And here's a picture of how that's done. So hold it in place while you pass partner squeezes the bag and sees the patient's chest rise. If you're alone, use the ECB clamp method of the for cast extension, changing the risk component to the bag uh, with ventilation and improvement or deterioration. So if it's not adequate, you, um, patient's chest does not rise or fall with each ventilation. Um, Maybe the heart rate don't determine normal. Um, the patient's stomach does rise. Um, reposition the head. Flow restriction oxygen power ventilation devices used um, to ventilate abdomen or hyperventilation patients. Can also be used to provide supplemental to for to breathing patients. And maybe it's just turn it on, let the patient breathe in supplemental. Main trigger the ventilation devices. Um, the band valve <laughs> triggered by negative pressure generated by inhalation. It does deliver um, almost 100% O2. It allows for a single rescue if they use both hands to maintain mass to seal, mass to stay still. It, do, um, it reduces rescue fatigue, especially with using bag mask device on extended transport, associated with difficulty. And maintain adequate ventilation without assistance. Um, virtually impossible to assess for lung compliance. The amount of pressure necessary to ventilate a patient adequately will vary according to the size of the patient. Um, pressures that are too great can cause a hemothorax. <coughs> so, attach it to a wall mounted oxygen source, um, set the ventilatory rate, how to volume, peak respiratory. Time has a perfect for patient's condition. Connect the ATV to the 15 20 millimeter fitting on the um, in the trigger to the other advanced airway device. Also, take the patient's breath down and observe for equal rise and fall. Most models have adjustments for respiratory rate and tidal volume. Pressure release valve can result in hyperventilation of patients with poor lung compliance, increased air resistance, and airway adjust, adjustment. Right. They are considered volume cycle and rated control ventilators. Um, set at a fixed rate, it will not cycle in conjunction with the limiting with the timing of chest compression. And oxygen power, although some models may require an external power source, has a parachute relief valve. 
which can result in hyperventilation in patients with poor lung compliance. CPAP, um, we're going to talk about this pretty good. So, continuous positive airway pressure. Non invasive means of uh, providing ventilatory support for patients in respiratory stress. So, these are used at night um, by people with obstructive sleep apnea. Um, early invention of CPAP is an alternative means for providing ventilatory assistance. Can prevent the need for um, in the trigger intubation. Um, it increases pressure in the lungs, opens collapsed alveoli, pushes more oxygen across the alveolar membrane, and forces interstitial fluid back into pulmonary, um, pulmonary circulation. Okay, so CPAP is just there pushing, pushing, pushing oxygen um, into those lungs. Um, and it, a lot of times it will help that fluid um, go back into pulmonary circulation also. So some of those the VLI may collapse down, um, and this force may open them back up just enough. The desired effect is to improve pulmonary compliance and make spontaneous ventilation easier. Indications are patients experiencing respiratory stress in which their own compensatory mechanisms cannot keep up with their oxygen demand. So some general guidelines. That first one is very important. Okay, that per that patient needs to be alert and able to follow commands. If you got a patient with any kind of autoimmune status or any kind of altered um, state of mind that they're not able to maintain their airway, they don't need to be put on CPAP. Um, obvious signs of moderate and severe respiratory stress. Respiratory stress have submersion incident, rapid rate of more than 26 breaths per minute, pulse oxygen imagery less than contraindications. Patient who is unresponsive or otherwise unable to follow verbal commands. Um, respiratory risk or agonal respirations, hyperventilation, hypertension, uh, pneumothorax, chest trauma, closed head injury, facial trauma, cardiogenic, uh, HH, um, active gastrointestinal bleeding, nausea, and vomiting, um, recent gastrointestinal surgical procedure, inability to possibly fit CPAP, and excessive facial hair or dysmorphic facial. Features. So basically, these patients need to be able to breathe, need to have that mentation to say, hey, I'm going to inhale, exhale. That's the only way the CPAP is going to adequately do what it's supposed to do. That inhalation to open up the alveoli to help that exchange, also a possibility of that fluid movement. If they're not able to do that, um, then the CPAP really isn't doing any good and you need to move on to something else. Maybe um, advanced airway placement or um, something to help these patients out. So patient exhales um, against resistance call positive in explanatory pressure. And, um, and this is talking about doing it on um, a ventilator. However, we do have some CPAPs that are power uh, the Caucasian. Some patients find CPAP claustrophobic. There's a way to fix that. Also, it could cause a, a pneumothorax so as a result of spare trauma. So it could possibly pop a lung. We are especially careful with those patients with COPD um, history, um, as it could cause. Baritrone. Increased pressure in chest cavity can result in hypertension. Um, if you do have CPAP on, that patient does become hypertension. Just take the CPAP off a lot of times, that'll fix that problem. Um, gastric distension likely to occur if the excessive pressure is used to inflate the lung, push the diaphragm upward into the chest. Um, Size of gastric distension, increased, increased diameter of stomach, increased weight of the skin and abdomen, increased resistance to the bag mouth ventilation. Um, laryngeal ectomy, trachea, um, ostomy, stoma, and tracheostomy tubes. A uh, surgical procedure in which larynx is removed, procedure is performed by making a tracheostomy create a stoma. So, uh, perform with extreme care when you suction in the stoma. Um, 
to resort in hypoxia. Um, sometimes even the slightest ear station of trachea and wall can result in violent eventual spasm. So you live the relaxation and you'll stomach to you can take it at a time. If you have a patient with stomach ventilation and use mouth to stomach technique or bag mask the body. An infant child mask to make an adequate seal of the stoma. Um, two rescues are needed to perform bag mouth device to stoma ventilation. The technique will only work if the patient had a partial laryngeal ectomy. Um, the stoma is sealed during ventilation. The ability to artificially ventilate the patient may be improved. Tracheostomy um, 2 is placed to place. Plastic to be placed within the tracheostomy site. So you may have a, um, looks like the end of an endotracheal tube in the tracheostomy site with the stoma. Uh, tracheostomy tubes require 15 to 22 millimeter adapters to be compatible with ventilatory devices. Uh, ventilation is caused by attaching a bag, bag mask device to a 15 millimeter adapter on the tracheostomy tube. So if it does become too large, um, stenosis of the stomach may occur and the patient may be less tolerant of even breathe through on the pot. Dental appliances can cause airway obstruction. Um, loose dental appliances should be manually removed before providing ventilation. Um, bag mask to bias or mouth to mask ventilation is used much easier when dentures, dentures can be left in place, um, the eye clear reassess the patient's airway to make sure the device are firmly in place. All right, facial bleeding, control bleeding um, with direct pressure and sedation. Um, facial injuries are associated with high suspension for cervical spinal injury. Um, when inserting any type of airway device, main inline stabilization of cervical spine. Okay. But try to get that spine in place. A lot of times, you know, we try to have somebody hold um, spinal mobilization when inserting. Or we'll have, sometimes we have to place an advanced airway with a cervical collar on. All right, the King LT Airways, the latex free single use single aluminum airway. Spinal inserting into the esophagus helps maintain tight airway in unresponsive patients who are breathing spontaneously. It can be used to provide positive pressure ventilation to your average patient. Uh, system curve two with ventilation points located between two and inflatable cuffs. Opens located between the two cuffs provide ventilation of the lungs after positioning is confirmed. So it can be used as a rescue airway device. There's two types. There's um, the King LTD and the King LTSD. Um, the LTSD is more commonly and comes in seven sizes. The, um, distal end of the D is closed, whereas the distal end of the LTSD is open. So, alternative to bag mask ventilation when a rescue device is required for feral innovation attempts, contraindications include do not protect their way from the effects of bone and aspiration, and it should be should not be used in patients with an intact skeletal structure. Um, some complications include um, laryngeal spasms, vomiting, and possible hypoventilation may occur. Um, trauma may result from improper insertion, insertion and technique. Ventilation may be difficult if the um, pharyngeal balloon pushes the airflow over the airflow customer. So, patients high in weight will determine the size of the airway. Um, and then we'll go over the steps later. All right, LMA uh, provides a feasible option for cases that require more airway support than mass ventilation, but do not require innovation. It's designed to provide a conduit from the glottic opening to the ventilation device. Opening the LMA is positioned right at the glottic opening. Uh, many advantages compared with ventilating um, unprotected airway with a mask provides better oxygenation. Ventilation does not require the continu continual maintenance of the mass seal. Insertion is easier. 
the first risk of soft tissue buccal cord jerky and wall and den dental trauma. Uh, it does provide protection from upper airways. Does not provide as much protection against aspiration as does in the trachea expert on intubation. May actually increase the risk of aspiration for a patient uh, if the patient regurgitates. It should not be considered for, as a primary airway for emergency patients. Indication and contraindication should be considered only when the patient cannot be intubated or face infected in a beach patient. It should not be used in patients with morbid obesity. It's ineffective for the ventilation of patients requiring higher pulmonary pressures. So some complica complications are regurgitation and subsequent aspiration. It should only be used in patients who are patients who are fasting. Hyperventilation of patients who require higher ventilatory pressures can occur. Patients should be monitored for evidence of upper airway swelling. It comes in seven sizes based on the patient's weight, consistent of a consistent of a tube and a mass ball. Inflatable cuff. Cuff provides a collar design to position the open of the tube and wide open. Two vertical bars are present at the open end of the tube. The cuff has a one-way valve, similar and should be inflated with a predetermined volume of air. Eye gel um, designed to create non inflatable anatomic seal of pharyngeal, laryngeal, and pre and gel structures. Color coded proximal hook rings indicate the size. Standard is sort of similar to the LMA um, and basically in a flight. Um, It features an integral bite block, a gas access channel, and subfunnel oxygen inlet port and a support strap. Um, and we'll talk about this step later. Cobra PLA is the distal part of the airway cobra shape. Subglottic device retrieved for ventilation and circumventional cuff proximal to distal here. It does come in eight sizes. Proper size is the one that comes with fit for the patient's mouth. Right. Frequently for use only in patients who are or not at risk of vomiting. Contraindications include risk of aspiration and massive tra trauma through the oral cavity. If not inserted far enough, inflation in the cuff may cause the tunnel to protrude from the mouth, disrupting the air flow. Insertion technique. Fully deflate cuff and apply water soluble gel to the front and back of the device and cuff. Open airway, we call them, cone jaw lift, maneuver and inflate the cuff and ventilate the patient. Can be inserted body into the airway, proven to secure the airway. Uh, Copy to it's proven to secure the airway and allow for better ventilation of the back mouth device. Uh, the tube can be used for ventilation, whether it's inserted into the sauce of the trachea, paint tube room, accommodate any ventilation device. A jaw thrust maneuver can easily alleviate, should easily alleviate any ventilatory difficulty that occurs with the FYS partially destroys airway. And it is considered a temporary um, airway and should be replaced as soon as possible. So airway management for our response to the patients with no gag reflex. Cannot be used in pediatric patients usually younger than 16. Should only be used for patients from 5 to 7 feet tall. And should not be used in patients on known pathological conditions of the soccer. So some complications unrecognized displacement into the soccer, very during spasm, vomiting, and possible high pose elevation. Trauma to the pharynx or esophagus from improper insertion technique. The ventilation may be difficult for the pharyngeal balloon pushes the FYs over the blockage. So you check both cuffs, ensure that the whole air patient's head should be in the neutral position for displaced jaw, insert the device, and inflate the cuff. Confirmation of ventilation is critical, and following inflation of balloons begin to ventilate the patient. 
confirm chest rise and fall in presence of breast. Um, foreign body that completely blocks the airway of a patient in a true emergency. Um, an adult usually occurs during a meal. A child usually occurs while eating, playing with small toys, or crawling around the house because they put everything in the mouth. And all spots of patient most common obstruction is the tongue. Right. With a mild airway obstruction, the patient can call forcibly, and although you may hear wheezing between the coughs, continue to monitor the patient closely and encourage the patient to continue coughing. Attempt to remove the object manually, um, could force the object further down into the airway and cause a severe obstruction. Right, signs of airway obstruction is sudden inability to speak or cough immediately after eating. The patient is found responsive, does not appear to be breathing, begins CPR with high, chest, high quality chest infection. Right, you know, basically, the crying is grasp his or her throat, and that's the universal sign of choking. Have section readily available. If any patient is unable, unable to maintain his or her own airway, and always assume that the patient who requires emergency health care have a full stomach in case they do vomit. And this is the end of chapter 11. Variables of ventilation to be precisely set. So you can set the ventilatory rate you can set the tidal volume peak inspiratory. It occurs by diffusion.